A second civil war. I wouldn't be the first to bring up the idea, and depending on your politics, you probably think the notion is either ridiculous or you're ready for the war to start tomorrow. But looking beyond all the hype, what are the chances this could actually happen, what does the leading political science say, and what can we do to stop it? Thankfully, we have a load of Second Civil War literature ready to help us answer these questions. Almost all of them predict that the sky is falling and that the war is coming tomorrow and we're all gonna die. Which is an easy way to sell books, but it's not exactly an academic way of looking at things. Among the pack of alarmist literature, How Civil Wars Start, a book by political scientist Barbara F. Walter, sets itself apart from the rest as a science-informed view on the subject. Walter, who studies civil wars around the world, concludes that a second civil war in the United States is a distinct possibility. There's been 122 civil wars since 1945 around the world, which gives us a pretty substantial sample size to find what the trends look like leading up to these conflicts. If you'd ask me before reading the book, I might say the primary predictor for civil war was poverty, or inequality, or economic crisis. But according to Walter, the primary predictor for civil war is actually a country's level of democracy. If a country is a total democracy where the government is controlled entirely by the people, or instead a full-blown autocracy where popular expression is suppressed, the risks of civil war are much, much lower. But if the nation sits in this nebulous middle ground where the government is semi-democratic, the risks increase exponentially. So if a government has substantial but not overpowering authority and the masses aren't totally repressed, then the country is at the greatest risk of civil war. This middle ground between democracy and autocracy has been dubbed anocracy, and the risk is even more heightened if the country is experiencing a political transformation, moving towards either end of the spectrum. When categorizing countries, researchers primarily rely on the Polity Index of Democracy, a 20-point scale measuring a variety of different factors. Most countries fall along the ends, but for the 20 or so that are in the anocracy zone, they should be worried. According to Walter, being a semi-democracy predicts civil war better than any other measure. And just at an intuitive, logical level, I mean, it makes sense. I'm reminded of the quote, War is a continuation of politics by other means, by some guy. Democracies allow people to translate their needs into action without resorting to violence by participating in elections, while dictatorships don't allow any room for resistance whatsoever. Meanwhile, an anocracy that has enough power to, say, commit human rights abuses when quelling protests, but not enough power to control their expansive countryside, opens up potential pockets of resistance. And if a country has recently opened up from autocracy to anocracy, you probably have a lot of groups with beef they want to quash with the newfound freedom to do so. The same goes for a country that has experienced democratic backsliding. People who have experienced political freedom are not likely to put up with the government overreach that comes with a state of anocracy. But anocracy isn't the only ingredient in the civil war pie. The second strongest factor, according to research by the Political Instability Task Force, which is a CIA-funded research project, is factionalism. When people in a country strongly identify with distinct factions that are defined along religious, political, or ethnic lines, the potential for struggle intensifies. Walter notes that factionalism isn't polarization. In a healthy democracy, some level of conflict and polarization is natural. Polarization can lead to factionalism as well, and factionalism is inherently polarized, but factionalization specifically refers to the process where people begin aligning themselves in distinct, incontrovertible groups. So think Northerner versus Southerner, or Hindu versus Sikh. And signs pointing to civil war worsen when these factions start to fight for political power at the expense of one another. The same goes for the presence of super factions, meaning factions that are built along more than just one intersection, so say religion and geography, or ethnicity. When super factions begin to show up in a country, that's a sign that the process of factionalization has reached dangerous highs. But they don't just arise on their own. 
Ethnic entrepreneurs are leaders that rise to prominence by fanning the factional flames and dehumanizing enemy groups. This is a story I'm sure you've heard before. It's the textbook rise of fascism story, and it's no coincidence the lead up to fascism and civil war are so similar. But we'll get to that later. Because not all factions are built equally, only a special few are likely to spark a war. Groups that are excluded from the political process or are otherwise marginalized are usually the ones to do so, but more specifically, groups that experience a loss of status, either political or cultural, are the number one type of faction that's likely to rebel. Experts refer to these groups as sons of the soil. They consider themselves the quote-unquote native people, and all others who have settled there or whose mother tongue is not the territory's main language are declared outsiders. In one study of civil wars since 1800, ethnic groups that fall into the Sons of Soil category rebelled at a rate of 60%, roughly twice the rate of those that did not. People may tolerate years of poverty, unemployment, and discrimination, they may accept shoddy schools, poor hospitals, and neglected infrastructure, but there is one thing they will not tolerate, losing status in a place they believe is theirs. In the 21st century, the most dangerous factions are once dominant groups facing decline. Anocracy, factions, loss of status, these are the kindling that makes civil war, at least according to Walter. So how does this apply to the United States? The 2020 Polity Index downgraded the United States from a full democracy to an anocracy, meaning the country lost its status as the longest continuous democracy in the world. That year we saw sweeping attacks on voting rights in a number of states, a sitting president casting doubt on the results of an election and defying congressional oversight, an increasingly partisan judiciary branch, and the list goes on. These are all events that weaken democracy in the United States. We saw the culmination of this process of democratic decay in the 2021 Capitol riots, where Trump supporters literally stormed the White House in an attempt to keep their guy in office. But while the riot might have been the most visible example of our deeply partisan conflict, Walter argues this started much, much earlier. She notes that before Obama was elected in 08, there were 43 active militia groups in the country. Only three years later, that number had exploded to over 300 a number made up largely by Sons of the Soil patriot type of groups that she argues were rebelling against the new era of liberal multiculturalism. Obama's election signaled a victory of the new political order that saw immigration, racial justice, LGBT, and human rights as a priority, and Walter believes the new right threatening this order is inherently a white supremacist movement. Hate groups have doubled since the year 2000, and for every plot to start a race war that's foiled by the the FBI, like members of the neo-Nazi organization The Base had planned at the beginning of 2020, there's dozens of acts of terror and violence that do come to fruition. From mass shootings in black neighborhoods to armed vigilantes roaming the southern border, it's undeniable that political violence is on the rise. The Peace Research Institute Oslo defines civil strife, a period that marks the potential beginnings of a civil war, as 25 combatant deaths within a year. And in 2019 alone, anti-government extremists were responsible for 42 deaths. While we're still very far away from the 1,000 deaths required for a full-blown civil war, these numbers should be alarming. This is easy to recognize, I mean, we've all seen the news. But while we all might recognize the changing political reality in the United States, current events can't be that bad, right? Think back to the 60s. You had a literal presidential assassination, corruption scandals, prolonged domestic unrest, and a powerful foreign adversary manifesting our downfall. If the country was ever gonna devolve into civil war again, that was it. But Stephen M., author of The Next Civil War, argues that the United States of today is different. When JFK was assassinated, the mourning was largely universal. Faith in institutions was much stronger before Watergate, and even though Nixon's corruption began to erode America's trust in its government, the media still relentlessly covered it. Compare that to today, where economic and environmental instability worsens every year. The fruits of the country accrue to only those at the very top. The government whose legitimacy is never established to the satisfaction of all parties cannot be relied on. 
faith in institutions of all kinds is declining, national purpose is withering, national solidarity is eroding. The government increasingly cannot, even when given clear mandates, respond to its people's will. Political gamesmanship overrides any and all other governmental concerns. Of the last four presidents, two have faced extensive impeachment proceedings, two elections of the past four have seen the popular winner defeated by an arcane system inherited from the 18th century, the judiciary is dogmatic and hardening to the point where the law barely holds meaning outside of the political context of the court's application. We live in a country so factionalized, living in informational silos on social medias, that the president being taken out like JFK would likely draw cheers from one side and conspiracies from the other. Walter notes that one of the main differences today is social media. Previously, any far-right group would have trouble gaining followers, as radios and newspapers would often refuse to spread their message. Walter uses the Swedish Democrats, a far-right political party, as an example. Before social media, they were a tiny fringe party, as even the Postal Service declined to spread their leaflets. Today, they're one of the biggest parties in the country, a shift helped in large part by the rise of social media, which gives anybody a platform no matter how hateful. In countries like Malaysia, Facebook was outright forced to admit that they were complicit in abetting the spread of false information that led to widespread ethnic conflict and community violence. Far-right movements and social media exist in a symbiotic relationship, as the far-right provides the outrageous content that gets pushed by algorithms that rely on engagement, feeding users the most anger-inducing content no matter how false which has, as Walter argues, created a race to the bottom in the fabric of society. But legacy media isn't off the hook either. The same conspiracy theory drivel is being spread by multi-billion dollar right-wing media enterprises. In 2022, the problem is no longer relegated to a few fringe groups. A substantial portion of the right is outright fanning the flames of civil war, pushing their faction forward by any means necessary. It's no surprise then that 88% of Trump voters don't believe Biden won the 2020 election, which is just mind-blowing. Vast swaths of the country are living in informational silos that no longer reflect reality. With the nation so fractured, 31% of Americans now believe a second civil war could be coming in the next five years. A panel of national security experts assembled by foreign policy concurred. According to the experts, the chances of a second civil war occurring in the next 10 to 15 years is 35%, which should be terrifying to everybody. We're barreling down the path towards conflict, and if things don't change, we might find ourselves blindsided by war like Americans were in the 1800s. With the power of hindsight, the first civil war seems inevitable. But as Stephen M. writes, on the eve of America's first civil war, the most intelligent, the most informed, the most dedicated people in the country couldn't foresee its arrival. Even when Confederate soldiers began their bombardment of Fort Sumter, nobody believed that the first civil war was inevitable. South Carolina Senator James Chestnut Jr. promised to drink all the blood spilled in the entire conflict. The common wisdom at the time was that he would have to drink not a thimble. The North was so unprepared for the war, they had no weapons. Similarly, events today appear chaotic and confusing from up close. But if you look behind the fury, it's not hard to perceive their direction. But the Second Civil War would hardly resemble the first. Instead, it would likely be a series of scattered acts of violence from various related but distinct groups. Walter envisions an asymmetric war waged by the federal government against militias, that are organized on social media, being supported by the sympathetic right-wing political machine. So think literally the plot of the Batman, only if the Riddler was way more racist and the attacks happened in more cities than just Gotham. Or think of the numerous acts of domestic terror today, only way more of them, way more often. That's the intoxicating allure of Walter's book. She looks at the trends of today and traces them to their logical endpoint. We know what way we're heading, the real question is, what can we do to stop it? This narrative was compelling enough to land the book a spot on the New York Times bestsellers list, and a load of heaping praise from mainstream outlets, and at first glance, it is compelling. But once you look past the surface, there are more than a few issues with the book. 
Firstly, Walter cites a number of studies and organizations with strong associations to the US government, which brings into question their impartiality. The polity measures of democracy, for example, were developed with funding from the CIA, and if you look at their map of democracy around the globe, it just looks like a map of US allies and enemies. According to the measurements, the last time America was an anocracy was between 1797 and 1800, which is just… really? The country that had a legalized apartheid system up until the 1960s was considered a full democracy. Well, that's because the measure, despite being used widely in academic research, is incredibly myopic in its definition of democracy. For example, VDEM, another more holistic measure of democracy, takes into account things like access to money and power across all groups in a country when defining democracy. If a group within a nation are realistically too poor or illiterate to participate in the political process, VDEM takes that into account while polity really doesn't care, instead focusing on the formal structures of government like divisions of power and so on. So just right off the bat, we're using literally the worst measure of democracy out there. VDEM has problems too, but polity is just bad. And according to political scientist James V, it puts the whole anocracy civil war connection into question. You see, the Polity Index considers whether a country experiences high levels of political violence as part of its measure of democracy. To quote the index itself, politics in anocracies are intense, hostile, and frequently violent. Extreme factionalism may be manifested in the establishment of rival governments and in civil war, meaning civil war and the conditions leading up to it are a part of the definition of anocracy. Which I mean, conceptually makes sense. If your country is too violent for people to vote safely, that's something that should be considered. But think about it. The conditions leading up to civil war are factors when defining an anocracy on polity. Meanwhile, Walter uses polity measures to predict civil wars. It's a circular argument. James V concludes that the original findings that associate anocracies with civil war is not driven by the relationship between political institutions and civil war, but rather by a less provocative relationship between political violence and civil war. When these elements are removed from the polity index, the original relationship disappears. Which is a pretty damning indictment of the arguments in the book. But we're not done yet, ladies and gentlemen. Let's say Walter replaced polity with VDEM. Researchers still find an association between VDEM, semi-democracies, and civil war. But does that give us airtight proof that a semi-democratic government is more susceptible to collapsing into civil war? I'd argue the association isn't so clear. Because at the broad level, this isn't the kind of thing you can study impartially. It's not like countries are born into this world as either a democracy, an autocracy, or an anocracy, and then devolve into civil wars at differing levels. Countries exist in the real world and are subject to the historical processes and power dynamics of the real world. Liberal democracies tend to be richer and centers for political power and capital. But how much of that is due to democracy and how much of that is due to the way the chips landed following hundreds of years of colonialism and global capitalism? Meanwhile, authoritarian countries like North Korea developed under siege by their capitalist neighbors, and their governments took the form they did in response to those conditions. That's not to say that every authoritarian nation is the way it is because of external pressure, but there's a reason the polity map looks the way it does. Democratic and authoritarian nations have developed in response to history, in response to the Cold War, anti-colonial and communist revolutions, and colonial and capitalist counter-revolutions. And any attempt at extrapolating global conflict rules from world history is going to be fraught with these biases. Take this statement as an example. Countries with high levels of a Muslim population are less likely to be democratic, which according to the research is true. But should we start crafting policy limiting immigration from Muslim countries for fear of weakening our democracy? Is it that Muslim people are an anti-democratic scourge, or is it more likely that due to the way history and colonialism played out, Muslim predominant countries have had a much more strained development, like in the case of Iraq? It devolved into civil war due to the destabilizing force of an empire like the USA, an empire that paradoxically spreads both war and liberal democracy. In the real world, you just can't remove these preconditions. And funnily enough, we actually might have a more universal cause for civil wars 
using US meddling over anocracy. This paper, for example, found that the incidence and onset of civil war globally increases under Republican governments and decreases with the US presidential approval. Meaning that when Republicans control the White House, civil wars increase in likelihood, as they do when presidential approval starts dropping, leading the researchers to conclude that Overall, our results suggest that US foreign influence is a sizable driver of conflict around the world. And I don't want your takeaway from this video to be that the US is the reason civil wars start, but if that ends up being your takeaway from this video, that's probably more true than Walter's conclusion. Aside from foreign meddling, researchers have found a number of other factors that contribute to civil war outcomes, and they're the usual suspects. Slow income growth, proportion of natural resources, rate of secondary school attainment, income inequality, poverty, ethnic polarization, or even the effects of diseases. All elements how civil wars start largely disregards. With all that said though, we can't close the page on the book just yet. Because I don't think I necessarily disagree with its conclusion that if we follow the political trends in the United States to their logical endpoint, political violence will rise. The US has undeniably experienced democratic backsliding and we're marking off quite a few conditions for civil war. Historic levels of income inequality, stagnant income growth, increased ethnic polarization, and factionalism. The conditions are all there, except for US foreign meddling, which Walter has apparently tweeted about? Complaining that the CIA isn't legally allowed to do counterinsurgency work here in the United States? Like if it's a bad thing? Like boy, she really wants the civil war thing to come true, huh? Cause if the CIA could do the shit they do in other countries here, we would literally be killing each other right now. Anyway, we are experiencing civil strife. Right now, white conservatives, won over by the fascistic right, are the prime candidates to escalate the levels of political violence, much more than anyone on the left is. So while I disagree with the why, it'd be wrong of me to dismiss the book entirely, because I genuinely do feel things are going to get worse before they get better. Unfortunately, how civil wars start falls completely on its face when it tries to predict how the second civil war would play out. It gets comically bad very fast. On the morning of Tuesday, November 14th, 2028, Wisconsin House Speaker Justin Lawrence steps to the podium to call the state legislature to order. Before he can speak, a bomb explodes. Reports circulate of large explosions in or around Capitol buildings in Denver, Atlanta, Santa Fe, and Lansing, Michigan. CNN has also received reports that earlier in the day, Secret Service agents foiled plans to assassinate President-elect Kamala Harris as she gave a speech announcing her intention to ban assault weapons. Black-clad men with automatic weapons force abortion clinics to close and intimidate customers who frequent minority-owned shops. No one stops them. Americans on the left begin to form their own militias to protect their families and neighbors. The local law enforcement and federal agents increasingly fade into the background, becoming secondary players in a larger contest between local militias as more and more Americans are forced to choose with which group to align. And like, I don't know if I'm just hung up on the president-elect Kamala fucking Harris part, but... But this is ridiculous, right? It's like literally liberal fanfiction that's only believable by the worst of suburban white people. Stephen M is a little less awful in my opinion in his fictional civil war scenarios, but it's all fundamentally the same. Conspiracy theories for liberals. Conservatives have baby eating demon rats and liberals have this. A tell of a coordinated uprising from armed militiamen that starts a nationwide race war. Don't get me wrong, we have a big fucking problem with armed white supremacists in this country. Just this Pride Month, the FBI has already caught a band of 30 white supremacists intending on starting a riot. But we're still very, very far away from the total disintegration of the social fabric that authors like Walter and Steven would like us to fear. It might feel like America is spinning off the track in the hyper-reality of the online media world, but this country is a lot more stable than people give it credit for. The economy might not be, but the social order is. The status quo, for better or for worse, still has an iron grip over things and violence is still very much at the fringes. As a counterexample, articles justifying the second civil war theory, as I'm gonna call it now, cite polls like this one that show that one in four Americans believe it's justifiable to engage in violent protests against the government. I think 
I even used it in a previous video to emphasize the changing state of things. But these polls are often used in misleading ways when removed from context. As Professor Sean Westwood argues, there are a lot of instances we can think of where violent protests against the government could very well be justified, like the Warsaw Ghetto Riots against the Nazis or the Civil Rights Movement in the US. And that is going to vary quite dramatically from what we saw on January 6th. So it's really impossible in the setup to know what respondents are agreeing to. We could argue that political and civil violence has entered the political imaginary in a new way, but it's not like those one in four Americans are armed and trained militiamen. They're just agreeing with this vague statement that can be interpreted in a million different ways that's not, I think it's good to, and I am planning to rebel against the US government that most media outlets interpret it as. Another fact used to just justify the second civil war is the fact that we have the highest rate of gun ownership in the world. But the reality is those guns are more likely to be used by the owners to kill themselves than in any armed rebellion. As anyone who's ever done organizing work can tell you, Americans are more concerned with their day-to-day -day interests and surviving week to week than they are in having a bloody revolution. And to argue this, I want to prove two points. The first is that the support for fringe groups like the far right is still minuscule. We turn to the book Reactionary Democracy, which argues that the far right are paper tigers, as the quote goes, terrifying in appearance, but in reality, not so powerful. According to the book, their support has largely been overstated by the media. In fact, their rise to prominence is in large part owed to the media and the disproportionate amount of coverage they've received, giving legitimacy to an otherwise unsupportable group. Take Donald Trump as an example, a political candidate who owes his victory almost entirely to a media who gave him near 24-7 coverage for the outrageous things he was saying. They tried to concoct a literal boogeyman out of him and it ended up blowing up on everyone's face when he actually got elected. But it's worth remembering that he lost both elections he ran in, losing the vote to both Clinton and Biden. While outlets like the New York Times portrayed him as a working class hero, there's little evidence to suggest that the people actually voted for him in mass. The NYT defines working class as people without college degrees. And I didn't know people who did go to college and write these articles need to hear this, but not having a college degree doesn't make you working class. There's plenty of non-college educated capitalists and plenty of graduates barely scraping by. Even using simple definitions of working class, we find that that if being working class means being in the bottom half of income distribution, the vast majority of Trump supporters were not working class, since only around a third of Trump voters made under 50k a year. His performance with the white working class is actually in line with Bush in 04, and no one ever claimed his election was unprecedented. The coalition that brought Trump to power largely resembles the voters that brought Reagan to power in the 80s. It's a coalition of white working class, petite bourgeois, and bourgeois voters united not by class, but by race. This is important to note, as the majority of households in the US make under 50k a year, as do the vast majority of adults. Most Trump voters were well off and voted based on what the authors argue is economic self-interest, or as most research has found, newly forming white identity politics. For example, this paper found that feelings of white vulnerability, of a loss of status, and of cultural resentment towards others were what mainly motivated his base. But instead of getting headlines like, one third of working class Americans support Trump, we get why the working class embrace right-wing populism, a complete misrepresentation of reality. Mainstream media would prefer to peg the problem on the masses, the voters, the people. There's a clear disdain for regular people in every narrative surrounding this issue. To quote Walter again, before, autocracy came about when military generals launched coups, but now it's being ushered in by voters themselves. I'm not trying to give you narrative whiplash here by going all over the place, but all of this is to illustrate the point that despite these authors' best attempts, the strong majority of Americans do not support the far right. Which leads me to the second point. It's not the people who are flawed, but democracy itself. We, the people of the United States, reads the first statement of the founding document of the country, and while the Constitution was obviously designed to construct a nation that was guided by the narrow interests of wealthy white men while colonizing the New World, 
those first few words are a good starting point that can help us define what a democracy is. Democracy is a system of government that's politically responsive to the will of the majority. At the most fundamental level, this is what democracy is. And the United States, according to the authors of Democracy in America, does not meet this definition of democracy. You see, most studies on the issue of American democracy argue that our system is pretty good, actually. Because if you look at graphs comparing public opinion with public policy, the two track pretty closely. When the majority supports something, it tends to get passed, and when they don't, it doesn't. Case closed, right? Well, the authors of the book argue that this isn't because the US is democratic. Instead, it's because regular Americans usually agree with the ultra-wealthy, the ones who really determine public policy on the majority of the issues. But if you refine the data to include only policies that regular Americans support and the ultra-wealthy don't, you find that the opinion of the majority has zero influence on what the government does. I'm gonna repeat that because it's pretty crazy. Whether Americans support or oppose something basically has no influence on what the government does. Look at this graph. The association between public policy and majority support is a straight line. Instead, the government is responsive to the tiny minority of capitalists. And because these two groups generally agree, like I said, this usually isn't a problem. When it comes to policies that affect the ultra-wealthy's wallets, the American people almost never get their way. Now, before we go further, some of you might disagree with our definition of democracy. You might say the people are fucking stupid. Why should we listen to the masses of a country where apparently one third of people believe the earth is flat, which I guess is a real statistic? And fair point. Americans as a whole are pretty uneducated about politics and, you know, most things in general. But surprisingly, research has found that policy preferences among the American people are consistent across time, and they lean overwhelmingly progressive. Most Americans don't devote a great deal of thought to politics, but they do have easy, direct access to some information that is highly relevant to public policy. The size of their social security checks, what's happening to their jobs and wages, the perhaps crumbling conditions of roads they drive on, price rises or declines in grocery stores or at gas gasoline pumps, on some of these day-to-day -day pocketbook concerns, and on such matters as neighborhood crime, the challenge of holding down a job with no paid sick leave, the difficulty of finding affordable child care, or the unreliability of public transportation, ordinary Americans may actually have better first-hand information than elites who live more rarefied, sheltered lives. As a result, most Americans, on most major issues, are able to form a general idea about what they want the government to do. They develop underlying tendencies of opinion. When the uncertain beliefs and opinions of millions of people are combined, the random noise is reduced. Collective preferences tend to be solid. They tend to reflect the underlying needs and values of the whole body of citizens. Considering that only two-fifths of Americans can name the three branches of government, three-fourths support breaking up big banks by reinstating laws like Glass-Steagall. On issue after issue, whether it's supporting expanding social security, universal health care, higher taxes on the rich, increasing the minimum wage, stricter environmental regulations, you name it, the majority of Americans are pretty progressive. This doesn't include things like reparations, I mean, <laughs> we're still talking about Americans here, but we even have polls showing majority support for stuff like trans rights, which I would have never guessed. And from a sociological sense, the reason why is simple. Most people's policy preferences reflect their class position. Working class people generally want outcomes that support the working class, even if they don't exactly see it that way. But the ultra-wealthy despise these policies, and it's why none of these things ever pass. Democracy in this country is fundamentally broken. And here's the rub, economic inequality and democracy are in an inverse relationship. While the research into this isn't perfect, as we don't have public opinion polls dating back to the 1800s, what we do have shows that historically, as inequality increases, quality of democracy decreases. The reason for this pattern is simple. Through campaign contributions, lobbying, influence over public discourse, and other means, wealth can be translated into political power. Our current crisis in democracy, at least according to Jacobin contributor Chris M, 
can be traced back to the 1960s. This was a decade that deeply terrified the nation's elites, with civil rights and socialist movements seriously challenging the balance of power. And while many associate the decade with protests, riots, and violence, the movements of the 60s and 70s can best be understood as brief explosions in democracy, in expressions of the people's control over their governments. The civil rights movement was a direct fight for democracy by black Americans, and the more radical groups like the Black Panthers and the Students for a Democratic Society all fundamentally fought for the creation of a more egalitarian democratic world. In response, The Crisis of Democracy was published in 1975, a report by the NGO, the Trilateral Commission, that sought to examine the governability of democracies. In other words, how to best manage democracies from the perspective of its elite managers. In its analysis of the United States, the authors concluded that the country was suffering from an excess of democracy and that it was in dire need of moderation. To keep democracy in control, it needed to keep mass movements in check and limit public spending on welfare. If this sounds diabolical and kind of evil, I mean, yeah, it was. Don't get me wrong, the Trilateral Commission is by no means some Illuminati group that controls politics in the US, and it was far from the only organization pushing this message. But in one way or another, the nation's elites heeded the message. The 50 years following the 70s saw a concerted effort to moderate democracy and the people faced blow after blow. Working class organizations and unions were dismantled, public spending on welfare was gutted, the surge in democracy was defeated. From there on, the new neoliberal order shaped the face of the country. Capitalists amassed an unprecedented level of wealth in an economy that has become increasingly prone to total failures. Best exemplified with the 2008 economic crash that's been followed by economic disaster after disaster. Manufacturing jobs left the country, leaving vast parts of the country behind with precarious employment. Most Americans live paycheck to paycheck and, well, I'm sure you've heard this story before. This is the dire state of American democracy, and I know we already finished shitting on how civil wars start, but I think there is something to the argument that a country's level of democracy is associated with maybe not civil war, but at least levels of conflict. Countries like the United States, the UK, and Hungary that have experienced democratic backsliding also pull highest in dissatisfaction with the economy and dissatisfaction with democratic politics. This is because the crisis of democracy and the crisis in white supremacy is a symptom of a bigger crisis, one that's signaling the decline of an empire. The United States has been compared to Rome since the very beginning, but we don't even have to go that far back for a direct corollary. As historian Harold James puts it, the US resembles the late Soviet Union on numerous fronts. The signs that predict the decline of an empire revolve around the state becoming too rigid to weather the storms that naturally come to challenge it. Is the United States capable and flexible enough to effectively manage a crisis? Well, if COVID is anything to go by, no. COVID-19 is a bad virus, no doubt. We can very easily imagine a much worse pandemic happening, and the country still managed to fumble its handling of the pandemic in every step of the way. People have grown so mistrusting of the institutions of their government that they can't even wear a fucking mask and take a vaccine without thinking there's some nefarious conspiracy behind it. COVID was the chaser, and the 2020s are probably going to be the last stable decade in a long time. Climate change alone is threatening the nation with mass migration from countries in the south and increased rates of natural disasters like floods and hurricanes. Geopolitical rivals like China threaten the country's ability to act unilaterally in its pursuit of influence and resources. Our economic system is so fragile and unequal that social issues are only going to intensify in the coming years. And maybe, just maybe, historians are going to look at the 2020s as the decade when the United States saw the writing on the wall and changed its political system for the better. But do you really think so? when the first democratic administration after Trump has done what exactly? The odds aren't promising. It's this crisis, call it a crisis of capitalism or a crisis of empire, that has Americans everywhere looking for answers to explain why the world is changing. 
In a country where people feel their institutions can no longer translate their needs into actions, some have resorted to abstaining from the political process altogether, others have become radicalized by the never-ending stream of right-wing conspiracies blaming the other. Without changing the underlying factors driving these trends, we risk ignoring the threat the fascist far-right poses to all of us. I'm reminded of this quote by Antonio Gramsci. We communists were among the few who took fascism seriously even when it seemed only a bloody farce. And when all the other parties tried to put the working class population to sleep by presenting fascism as a superficial phenomenon of a very brief duration. While a majority of the country doesn't support the far right, we shouldn't be so quick to dismiss them either. If things don't change, in a few years, civil war might be a very realistic possibility.